All right, you can grab a seat. I hope each one of you feel encouraged. You feel built up. Today, we are going to start uh, focusing on one of my favorite portions of Scripture. Uh, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. Now you know why we're serving lunch after church, right? No, don't worry. We're not going to cover all of them today. We're actually just going to give a brief overview. But for the next few months, this is where we're going to be. How many like the book of 1 Corinthians? Okay, some of you. How many of you don't really know where I'm going with this or any clue? Or... That's okay. But the book of 1 Corinthians is just its a really an amazing letter because uh, Paul really, he lays out how do you do church life, okay? How does the church operate? Now, chapters 12, 13, and 14 all focus around spiritual gifting. How do you operate in spiritual gifting? Now, I know a lot of times we take a look at this, and you've all heard of the love chapter, right? It's 13, and we hear it at weddings all the time, and we call it the love chapter. But we got to understand that when Paul's talking about that chapter in love, he's talking about the use of spiritual gifts. Okay, he's not talking about marriage. He's not talking about uh, relationship. He's talking about how do you operate in spiritual gifts, and that's the meaning of love. So, I, I, I'm I'm just really excited about where we're going to be going as a church uh, as we look at this passage of scripture. And one thing I'm going to ask you to do is take out your Bibles, take out your phones, whatever, and mark down these chapters. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And make an effort to read these at least once a week, okay? For the next two months, three months, we're going to spend some time here. But I want you to spend some time just allowing these, these passages to soak into you. So it's not just something you hear on a Sunday morning, but it's something that God can just build in and encourage you on every level. So, so where are you going to read? Right. Some of you are paying attention. That's awesome. See, I, I see these passages as God's pattern for how he wants the church to operate. And it doesn't do good for us not to understand this. We, we really need to understand how God operates, how he intends his gifts to operate in the church. Just to remind you, Mark chapter 12, verses 29 to 31, and Pastor told this last week, if you, if you weren't here or you missed it, it's on YouTube, you need to hear this. But in Mark chapter 12, 12, 29 to 31, we have the great command. Jesus answered them, said, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than now, obviously, this came after uh, Jesus was challenged, and then they came to him, and, Jesus, and they said, well, we have all the law. The, we have the Ten Commandments. We have all the laws, the, the laws. What is the greatest commandment? What is the one thing that we really should follow? This was Jesus' response, okay? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, okay? So if that's the greatest commandment, that's probably the greatest thing we need to focus on. Agreed? Agreed? We need to focus on love. We need to focus on loving God with everything we have. Our gifts, our talents, our abilities, our time, our knowledge, our friendships, our relationships, our marriage. Everything needs to fall into this category where we are enveloped in love. Loving God first. Loving our neighbors as ourselves. So that's kind of the foundation of everything we do. And we're going to talk about this uh, in later weeks, as we talk about uh, getting into 1 Corinthians 13, but we also have the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, Jesus came up to them and spoke to them, saying, All authority, say all authority, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So get this. The greatest commandment is that we love God and that we love our neighbor. 
we love the people around us. The greatest commission, the great commission, is that we are to make disciples all over the world. These are the two foundational principles of the church. If we aren't doing either one of them, we can't even call ourselves a church. We can't. We're a social club. We're an organization. We're whatever. But if you want to fully be what God has called us to be, we need to focus on love and we need to focus on discipleship. The two go hand in hand. Because if you love someone, you don't want them to go to hell. Amen? So it all begins with love. It doesn't begin because your pastor tells you you have to evangelize. It doesn't come because you, oh, you feel guilty because you're not doing it. It all comes out of a source of love for people. If you love people, you want the best. It's like a parent and a child. Your parent loves your kid, right? What do you want your kid to have? Everything good, right? As a parent, you want your kid to excel. You want your kid to grow. You want your kid to increase. You want your kid to be successful. All of these things you want. Why? Because you're the parent and it makes you look good? No. Because you love them. And you want the best for them. That is the basics of the family dynamics, of relationship. We're in relationship because of love for one another. Same thing in a church. We're in relationship with one another and it's founded in love. Okay? You're not here by accident. The person beside you isn't here by accident. You're actually here by divine appointment. Each and every one of us. So our motivation and method is love. And our mission is to make disciples. This is, this is really the only thing we, we need to focus on as a church. If we get this foundation down, we will be able to reach the destiny and the goals and the dreams that God has for us. Many of you were here a few weeks ago when I shared with you the, the dream that God has put on my heart, the vision that he has laid on me that as a church we are going to see 100 million disciples of God. And I know we can look at that and we can say that's impossible, that just doesn't make sense. There's only 35 million people in Canada. How can we make 100 million disciples? I showed you the math. The numbers work. If, if we take 60 people and each year those 60 people each bring one person to Christ to disciple them, in 21 years you'd have 125 million disciples. This is not an outlandish dream. This is not unrealistic. It's actually very simple and very easy. But the fact is, we're trying to do church without actually being church. We're trying to do things without actually doing them in the way that God intended us from the beginning to do it. See, God has called his people to make disciples. He expects it. Okay? Don't, don't justify it. Don't think. Don't, don't do anything. Just know God expects you to be making disciples. It's his expectation. You're going to die one day, or he's going to rapture us up to heaven if that comes first. You're going to go up. You're going to stand before God, and he's going to ask you some questions. And one of the things he's going to ask you is, who did you disciple? I guarantee you that is going to be a question. He may phrase it a little bit differently. He might ask you, who did you bring with you? And I believe that that day will come when we will look behind us and we will see every person that we touched in this life. Every person that we played a role in them being, having a destiny in heaven. That day is coming. I believe it. I believe each and every one of us will stand before the beam of seat of God and we will be called to account. Not, this is not a, do you get to go into heaven or not? This is a, what rewards are you going to get? Okay? It's not, it's not the judgment seat of the Lamb. It's, it's the Bema seat. It's a reward seat. It's where, where rewards are given out for actions. And, and yes, we do not do this for rewards. Don't, don't get that in your head. That, oh yeah, I'm doing this so I get my reward in heaven. No, you're doing this out of love. Love has to be the motivation. Love has to be desire. Now over the next little while, I want to flush out how we are going to reach this. And when we look at chapters 12, 13, 14, and we take it in 
the light in which it was written. Paul was writing this so that the church would for gifts. We can see the first Corinthians twelve, the first one, really talks about being Christ centered. Okay? Every gift needs to be Christ centered. It has to be around God. It has to be focused at God. Any other method, any other desire will not work. The second is 1 Corinthians 13, is it done in love? Are you operating out of your gift in love? I want to tell you how critical this is because the spiritual gifts in the church are not something new. Okay? The spiritual gifts in the church have been around since the birth of the church. Okay? They, they've always been there, every age, every Every area, the gifts of the Spirit have always been present. The gifts have not always been used wisely. The gifts have not always been used in love. There's a lot of times where people will have a gift, they will use it, and it will bring destruction. It will bring the anarchy. And you say, how can that work? God gave this gift. It can only be used for God's purposes. No. It's, it tells us that the, the gifts of God are irrevocable. When God gives a gift, he can't take it. If that person decides to do something stupid outside of love, guess what? They can do it. That might answer you some questions you have about certain people you see who are ministering around who do stupid things. Because the gifts are irrevocable. When God gives you a gift, he won't ever take it back. You have it for life. And then uh, the third point is, does it edify the church? And so, again, these are three full chapters. If I spent months on these, we wouldn't flush out everything, okay? This is probably one of the meatiest portions of Scripture, getting an understanding for how we operate in spiritual gifts. So I want to challenge you. Make this, make this a point that once a week or twice a week you read through these three chapters. Maybe three times a week you read through one of these chapters. Figure out what works for you. Read through these. Let this just siphon through you. Get an understanding of what it means to operate in spiritual gifts. Because I don't want to have spiritual gifts introduced and people operating and then have all anarchy. And that's what happened in Corinth. That's what happened. That's why we actually have the book of 1 Corinthians. Because the people of Corinth got so excited about the gifts. They got so excited about the gifts, they were operating in them, and it just became anarchy, it became chaos. So Paul looked at them and said, hey, 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 stop, wait a minute. This is the way you need to operate in the gifts. And, and that's really what the book of 1 Corinthians is all about, telling them as a church, how do you do it? Specifically, these chapters are, are working, how do you work in spiritual gifts? How do you operate them? How do you, manifest? How do you ma have them manifest in your life so they do the most good? Before you begin to panic, we're not going to. We're going to spend some some words of wisdom. I read them. There's a fine line between a long drawn out and a hostage situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so don't worry. That's my that's my mantra now. I understand that. I, I have 15 minutes to get into the rest of them. So when Paul writes this letter to the church at Corinth, there's a problem. And the problem really is this, to sum it up. It's freedom versus responsibility. They had erred on the side of believing they had freedom to do everything. Okay, Because in Christ, we do. We have freedom to do everything. They discounted the other side of the equation, which is responsibility, because with freedom comes responsibility. And they forgot about the responsibility, they just had freedom. And they exercised their freedom. They got so excited about their gifts, they wanted to just keep doing it and doing it. They didn't care what the results were, they just liked the fact that they got to prophesy. They loved the fact that they got to do um, healings, and they got to do it, and it, it became more about them than the body of Christ, because every gift is given for the edification of the body of Christ. Okay, understand that. Every gift is, it's not just so you feel good about yourself and, oh, wow. I prayed for someone and they got healed. I must be pretty special, okay? That's not the mindset that we need to have. We need to understand that when we're praying for someone, we're actually serving that person on behalf of God and allowing God to minister to them through us. Who gets the glory? God gets the glory. God gets all the glory. So we have to 
take that into account and, and remember that, that it's him who does it. You see, the mindset had taken over the Corinthian church. And it was this mindset that I can do whatever I want. Paul writes him a letter to put him back on track. It kind of reminds you of where our culture is. I have the freedom to do whatever I want. I can do whatever I want, and nobody can tell me otherwise, right? That really is a prevailing thought in our culture. We have to make absolutely certain it doesn't evolve into the church, that we don't get this attitude, yeah, I can do anything I want. Yeah, you can technically, but should you? Should you be so self-centered and so self-designed that everything you do is about you? Or should you take a page from Jesus' book and, and say, no, it's not my life, but it's his life that I 1 Corinthians 4, 20, 14, 29 says, Let two or three prophets speak, and then let the others pass judgment. You see, some people have, have taken this verse, and I've actually seen it where uh, pastors have taken this and said, yeah, we don't need prophecy in the church, right? We don't need it. Even Paul talks about diminishing it and making it less. No, Paul is not diminishing prophecy here. Paul is not breaking it down. What he is saying here is there has to be order. There has to be and think about it this way. This is what Paul was dealing with. You would have 10 or 15 people stand up at the exact same time and start prophesying all at the same time. That was the issue he was dealing with. Do you think that's productive? Do you think that edifies the body of Christ? No, it doesn't. You just, it just became, as Paul talks about, a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. It just became noise. That's all it was. It's not simply about having a gift and getting to exercise it. It's about using your gift to exercise it so that the body of Christ is edified and built up. So that's why Paul came and said, hey, just instead of everybody standing up at the same time and giving their prophecy and nobody hears it, nobody understands it, it's just a big noise. How about have just two or three people stand up one after the other and then after they prophesy, then sit down and discuss it. First of all, is this message from God? Yes or no? Secondly, how do we implement this? How do we do what God has told us to do? You see, that's, that's a major step that, that modern Pentecostal churches have really met. We hear a prophecy and we think, oh, that has to be God's will because it came out of a prophet's mouth. So God must be wanting that. No, guess what? That's Old Testament. New Testament is each one of us hears God. Each one of us hears God. So when somebody stands up and, and says something and prophesies, you need to check it in your spirit and say, okay, God, is that your word? Yes? No? If it is, okay, God, what are you telling us to do? And then we, get to, we sit down and do it. See, that's, that's how you make prophecy productive. That's how you, you make it so that you verify it's God's will and then you carry out what he wants you to do. Without that step, it becomes just a noise. And that's what Paul is countering. And then 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul attempts to bring order to a church that's so excited about their spiritual gifts, they become an unintelligible noise. I want to just read chapter 12 to you today, just to get you started on it. And we're not going to deal with all of this stuff. I have a very small portion I want to look at, but. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1 and begin, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are a variety of gifts, the same Spirit, and there are a variety of ministries, the same Lord, and there are a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. Say all. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another the gifts of healing by and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another distinguishing of spirits, and to another variety of kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. 
But the one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing them to each one, say each one, individually, just as he wills. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all of the members of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not the hand, I am not part of the body, it is not the reason, any reason or any less part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not part of the body, it is for, not for this reason any lesser part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were one member, where would the body be? But now they are many members, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on those we bestow, bestow abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked. So there is to be no division in the body, but that the members have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body, individually members of it. And God has appointed the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and miracles, then the gift of healings, helps, administration, and various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles. All are not prophets. All are not teachers, are they? All are not, are not workers of miracles. All do not have the gift of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts. And still I show you a more excellent. You get that? There is a lot of meat in that passage, you would agree? It's not something we can just cover one Sunday or, or one time. This is something I, I want you to read over and over and over again. And as you read it, God will bring things to you, greater understanding, greater knowledge. So for this week, 1 Corinthians 12, I want you to focus on that, okay? Start reading it. Read it through a few times. Read it through slow. Read it through fast. Read it through all you sing it. Do, do whatever you need to do to get this into you. Because this is really the basics of where it is. Now, I do have a, a video, but we're going to show that next week. Um, I'm just going to move on. I, I really see four key factors in this passage of Scripture. Now, there's a lot more than four, but these are just four I want to highlight right now, today. The first thing is, your past does not matter. Your past does not matter. It doesn't matter who you were before you came to Christ. Okay, that's inconsequential. The passage says, for by the Spirit we were baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. So you see in this passage, Paul uses the, the most diverse groups there were. Okay? The greatest opposition would be between the Jews and the Gentiles. Okay? That's probably the biggest division of groups that you had at that time. The other big group a division was between somebody who was a slave or somebody who was free. So Paul says, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek. It doesn't matter if you're a slave or free. That doesn't matter. Past does not matter. You get a new beginning. You get a new start. And everybody is on the same playing field. We are all there together. The second part and this is very, very critical that we understand this, is that your gift is not inferior to anybody else's. Get that, get that down, okay? Often in the church, we look at somebody who has this gift, and we say, wow, that's so amazing. 
like that they can do that. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, I feel this way too. When I when I look at individuals, uh, Sean Bull, these guys, he operates in, in the gift of knowledge at such a high level, and I just look at him and say, "Wow, that's just amazing. That's just amazing to see." And and if you don't know who I'm, who I'm talking about, just go on YouTube and uh, type Sean S H A W N Z. And watch some of his, his stuff. There. He's, he's operating at such a high level. It's just so amazing to see. But we need to remember that our gift is inferior to anybody else's. Certain people may have a greater development of that gift because they've worked on it more. They have a greater anointing. They, they've worked on it in certain ways that now all of a sudden they're more developed in it. And if you're just starting on your gift, maybe you're not as pronounced. But that doesn't make it any more inferior. It doesn't make it any less. And when we look at the variety of gifts, we can't say this gift is more important than this gift. We can't say that gift is more important than this. It doesn't exist. Every gift is critical. It's like if you try to build a house out of Jenga blocks, have you ever done this, right? And you pile them up and then you build a little structure. Anyone you take out of there could make it fall. Because every single one of them is important and critical for support. The same thing here happens in the church. Like We may have people who are gifted in singing and gifted in playing instruments. That's a great gift. But don't think that because you can't play the piano, you're less important. Or you can't stand up and sing, you're less important. Okay, That's not true at all. Every gift is important and vital for the operation. Somebody who has a gift of cleaning the toilet is just as important as somebody who can stand up here and sing. Okay? We need that understanding. Shoveling snow today is a great talent to have. Okay? It's a great ability. Anybody who loves doing it, you know you have the talent for it. But we need to look at this and say, yeah, there are no insignificant gifts. Everything is important. And you may be called to do something that in your own eyes, well, that's not important. But I want to tell you, it is hugely important, okay? We have greeters who greet people when they come in. And you may think, well, I'm just a greeter. That's not a big deal. I'm not the pastor who prays for people to get healed. I'm just a greeter. Well, let me tell you something. Statistics show right now that when somebody comes to church, a new church, they make their decision in the first seven minutes while, if they're going to come back. Seven minutes they make their decision whether or not they're going to come back to that church. I don't even meet. It's not me why they come back. They won't even hear the worship team in the first seven minutes. It's not the music they come back for. Realize how pivotal of a role even our greeters play. Realize what a pivotal role the people who empty the garbages play. Can you imagine coming in here and having the garbage all over the place and just stinking up the place? It would be no fun for any of us. Everybody has a role to play. Everybody has a job to play, okay? And your job, your role, is not inferior to anybody else's. The third, it kind of overlaps the second, but the third one is everyone plays a vital role in the success of the mission of this church. Everybody has a job. How many times in 1 Corinthians does it say all? How many times does it say and all to each one? Okay? Everyone has a gift. Everybody has an ability to work with God in a specific situation carry out his plans. and Everybody does. Every single one. If somebody sits down there and says, I don't have a gift, I'm going to look at you and say, you are a liar. Because that's what you are. You're a liar. Okay? We know you have at least one, because the Bible says that. But I guarantee you, most people... And, and I'm not... When I, I just want to make this reflection... When I'm talking about a spiritual gift, I'm talking about your gift. Your natural ability may point towards your gift. Granted, that happens all the time. But your spiritual ability is basically your ability 
to partner with God to carry out a certain plan. So you may think, oh, I can shovel snow. How many of us can shovel snow? Pretty much everybody in this building has the ability to shovel snow, unless you have got a medical condition and you shouldn't shovel snow. However, the difference between the per- all of us and the person who has a gift to, do, to serve that, we would call that the gift of service, okay? A person who has the gift of service gets joy out of it, okay? When they're shoveling the snow, they are the best snow shoveler, okay? That's what's in their head, okay? I can shovel snow better than anybody else, okay? That's what they're thinking because that's what their gifting is. If you're doing something and you're saying, oh, guess what? It's probably not your spiritual gifting. That being said, you still probably have to do it, okay? (laughs) Because it is life. (laughs) There are lots of things in life you still have to do, even if you don't like doing it. I'm not saying, oh, we only do the things. What I'm saying is one way to recognize your spiritual gift is that it will reflect your passion. It will reflect your desires. You will love doing it when you're doing it. Shoveling the snow, great example. Uh, evangelism. You may say, well, I don't have the gift. That doesn't matter. You see. Every Christian has the gift. We're all called to make disciples. The unfairness of this is there are certain people who have the gift of evangelism who will be far more successful than you will be. Why? Their passion is. It's what they think about 24-7. And so when we look at these, there are certain gifts that every Christian should have. Okay? But when we talk about the gift of it, it means that heightened ability to operate in that area where you have the passion and the gift. Now the fourth point to look at today is that we are all in this together. Now, We can do it. We are all in this together. Okay, there are no lone ranger Christians. When you go to operate in your gift, you're not the only one. Oh, I'm just doing my gift. No, it means your gift is infected by somebody else's gift, who's affected by someone else's gift. It's all put together. When you look at the gifts, it's just amazing to see how God kind of lined them all up to all work together. Perfect example is the gift of prof- or the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation, okay? If you have tongues without interpretation, it falls flat. You can't interpret what's not a tongue. The two go together. To me, it's one of the best examples of of how these giftings work, but that's just an example because every gifting works together with other giftings, okay? You want to talk about the, the person who operates in miracles? They cannot operate in miracles without the person who has the gift of faith. Okay? The gift of faith enables those miracles to take place. So everything, there is a, there's a partnership with it. So that's the other part. Don't think that what you have to do is so small and insignificant because the truth of the matter is this. If you don't do it, if you can't do it, somebody else can't do what they're called to do. You see, we're all in this together. We're all working at this. We all have a different part to play. It's like if you were to have making a cake and and one person is supposed to bring the flour, another person is supposed to bring the sugar, another person is supposed to bring the milk, another person is supposed to bring the salt. What happens if everybody brings salt? (laughs) You don't get a cake. And you may be thinking there, I don't want to bring salt. Salt's stupid. It's just salt. But you realize that if you don't have all the ingredients to make the cake, the cake will not work out. The same thing is true in the church. Unless everybody brings what they are called to bring, what God wants to do won't reach the potential that he wants it to reach. If you don't show up one Sunday because you want to sleep in and you're tired, guess what? There will be a lessened move of Yes, 
You attending church and worshiping God affects how the person beside you hears from God. We're all tied in. We're all with this together. So even if you don't feel like coming to church, maybe think about the person who wants you to be there for them. Stranger. I make it. I understand that. But what I want you to see is that you are vital and important. And we're all in this together. You get that? We're going to call the praise team up. And I want to just say this as they come up, it'd be pretty silly if none of us were here and they were just up here doing this by themselves. They'd still probably do it because they love doing it. But it's you, it's your singing, it's your worship, it's your attitude that God is actually here to see. It's your heart he's looking for. So when we're worshiping, realize that you play a huge role in how the Spirit of God moves. When I'm up here praying for someone, I have noticed a huge difference of the success of my prayers is totally dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit within the congregation. I have noticed that there are times where, you know, we're a little down or we're a little, we're not really paying attention. We're kind of in our own little place and I'm praying for something and I'll pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and finally get breakthrough. Then we'll come over here and have the same situation where the faith in the room is just huge. It's massive where everybody is just, yeah, they're worshiping God. The glory of God is just falling in this house and I'll go and I'll just start one word and the person will be healed. There is a direct correlation. Why? Because what happens at the altar time can only happen when the presence of God is there. Who brings the presence of God? All of us. So when we're praying, this is just another side note. You know what, when, you're, when we're praying for people at the front, when you're out there, I want you to be praying for them too. Even if it's a place of worship, just pray God to do it. And lay your, so that each one of us are, are a part of what God. Can we do that? Amen.